Well, good morning again, everyone. And uh, to those of you who are watching online today, we welcome you as, as well. Um, I said in a, a, a video earlier this week and in a letter earlier this week that uh, I was aiming for a devotional message of 12 to 15 minutes because of all the component pieces in this service. And uh, uh, it's going to be 20, I think. I just, as I look at my notes, I just couldn't condense it further. This core value is so important. Um, to those of you who are visiting with us today at Grace, uh, welcomed to you. And I know that there is one couple that's here today who are visiting, who uh, they've got a relationship with this church. He has spoken in this church in the past. And Ann and I have a long history with this couple. Hank and Ann Steed are here today. Hank and Ann, where are you? Right now, they're there, right here. Let's just welcome Hank and Ann. For 22 years, Hank was associate pastor at Bethel in Marquette. Just retired on October the 3rd. And uh, retirement just means that he's not vocationally going in there every day, but they're still so involved in ministry, Hank and Ann. Ann was my administrative assistant when I was the pastor there starting 34 years ago. And uh, Hank, you were one of the elders and such a great friend. And so good to have you here today. Well, this morning we're going to be continuing in a series that we've called Grace Church Core Values. And on the screen, there is a graphic that corresponds to our current teaching series. In this series, we're aiming to underscore some distinctive emphases that we call core values. And what we said last week and are going to say again this week and hopefully every week through the series, our core values flow out of our stated purpose or mission. We refer to it as our vision at Grace. And the vision statement, very simply stated, is to know Christ and to make Christ known. Now, while that's simply stated, that is a massive and glorious objective to give ourselves to. We orient around Jesus here. Not perfectly, but decisively. He's the treasure in the end toward which our focus is directed. And the more the eyes of our hearts are opened to him so that we see with increasing clarity his majesty and his worth, the more our love for him grows, the more our trust toward him grows. And as we get to know him better and better, the greater is our passion to make him known to others. We want to share this treasure that's ours in Jesus with as many people as we can because Jesus is, we believe, the hope of the world. After his resurrection from the dead, Jesus assigned to his church in the first century and it's a commission that's ours to discharge today. He gave us a commission to make disciples. Those who know and love the risen Lord Jesus personally want. They desire to make him known to others. They embrace his commission to make disciples. And so here's the deal. As we live on mission with Jesus, there's an inescapable reality that's essential to fruitful progress in making disciples. We might frame it up this way, that the multiplication of leaders is crucial in advancing Christ's mission in the world. The multiplication of leaders is crucial in advancing Christ's mission in the world. At Grace Church, one of our core values relates to multiplying leaders and this is the way it's stated here we believe in identifying and equipping emerging leaders for service in the church now our core values are inextricably tied to our vision statement and here's the implication when we say we believe in identifying and equipping emerging leaders in the church what we mean is this, that the multiplying of leaders, think about this now everyone, 
Think about this. The multiplying of leaders is vital in our desire to make Christ known to more and more people. It's essential. It's not optional. It's not an addendum to our mission. This core value is an integral component of our vision as a church. If you have a Bible with you or a Bible app in your phone, you could turn with me to 2 Timothy 2, verses 1 to 2. Now, this passage is also going to be on the screen. And this is what we read, beginning 2 Timothy 2, verses 1 and 2. The Apostle Paul writing to Timothy, who was a generation younger than he was, you then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Now, with that passage still on the screen, let me say a couple of things real briefly about the context. The writer of this letter, Paul, is near the end of his life. This is the last letter that he writes. And so I think it's fair to say that there's a sense of urgency in him, in his writing. He's writing from a prison in Rome. And as he nears the end of his life, he's focused on exhorting younger leaders. Younger leaders who will carry the baton of gospel leadership into the next generation. And one of those young leaders was a young man named Timothy. Timothy had uh, come to Christ, it's believed, through the ministry of Paul. When Paul came through his hometown on the first missionary journey. Timothy then became a missionary companion of Paul. He'd been mentored by this older faithful leader. And Timothy, at the time of this letter, was serving as a pastor in the city of Ephesus, and it was not an easy ministry. Ephesus was a commercial center, and it was a travel destination. Idolatry and corruption in Ephesus was rampant some of which related to the presence of a pagan temple in the city that featured worship of a pagan goddess named Artemis. In the ancient world, it might have been said of this city of Ephesus, what happens in Ephesus stays in Ephesus. It was that type of city in the first century. And in the midst of the challenge and the ongoing opposition to the ministry of the gospel in that city, Paul seeks to exhort Timothy to stay the course. Ministry's hard. Timothy, my son in the faith, stay the course. Stay the course. And even in that first statement in verse one of Second Timothy 2, it's evident that as Paul speaks into Timothy's life, that his mentoring relationship with Timothy is special. It's like, it's like a familial relationship. In the NIV translation, Paul refers to Timothy as my son. In the ESV translation, Paul refers to Timothy as my child. Not a demeaning term in any way. It's a term of relationship, familial in Christ, familial relationship. Here's the point. The nurture and development of emerging leaders happens best and most effectively in the context of meaningful relationship. Meaningful relationship. From what we can gather from the New Testament concerning Timothy, he was probably in his 30s, his mid-30s probably, when he received this letter. He'd been ministering in Ephesus for a number of years now. And as I said, it had not been an easy ministry there. 
We learn in chapter 1 that his mom and grandma were influential in his growth as a gospel man for a variety of reasons. From this letter, from Paul's first letter to Timothy, and from the book of Acts, for a variety of reasons, it appears likely that Timothy grew up in a home where his dad was not a believer. So in a very real sense, Paul was like a spiritual father to Timothy. It's where this language comes. My son, my child. That was the relationship between the two of them. And in the context of that mentoring, that spiritual father relationship, there were two words that surface in these couple of verses. One explicitly and one implicitly. Two words that underscore the importance of leadership development in the church. First of all, there's the word strength. Strength. In verse 1, Paul says to Timothy, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Christian leadership is hard. And it's getting harder. And in those times when ministry gets especially weighty and challenging and difficult, when you see people you have cared for and prayed for and invested in, not making progress in the faith, or people you love who are indifferent or antagonistic to Jesus. Well, you suffer. You ache. Paul tells Timothy in verse 3, suffer as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And even as Timothy reads this letter from Paul, Paul is just weeks away from execution in Rome. He's writing about 64 to 65 AD, and there was an emperor in the Roman Empire at that time whose name was Nero. And Paul uh, died by execution during the reign of Nero. And so, so the question rises, I think fairly, where does the strength come from to suffer well when leadership is hard? In other words, it's one thing to say leadership is hard. Does that mean I do this and I walk away? Or, or is there something that God has given to us in his word, by his spirit, that helps us to bear up when it is difficult and hard? That we don't run when the going gets tough. And Paul says in verse 1, it comes from the grace that is in Christ Jesus. That's not a throwaway line. It's not stained glass talk. Leaders continue as leaders in ministry, whether they're vocational, whether they're non-vocational, whether they're pastors, whether there are leaders within the church. You continue in ministry by laying hold of the grace that's in Christ Jesus. This is a big deal. I mean, this is a big deal. Paul is not saying, find the strength within yourself, Timothy. You've got it in you. Find the strength within yourself, Timothy, so that you can slug it out. That's not at all what he says. He says, rather be strong in the grace of the Lord Jesus. Timothy, remember the gospel. Remind yourself of the gospel 
every day. Remember its eternal implications. Remember how Jesus Christ gave himself for you. He not only entered history, leaving all the privilege of heaven, it was all directed toward a day when on our behalf, at great expense to himself, Jesus laid down himself for us. And then he conquered death. He's alive today. He's alive today. And that has ah, staggering, eternal implications for us. The call to be strong is rooted and grounded in the grace of our Lord Jesus. It's interesting, Paul closed another one of his letters in the New Testament. His, letter, his second letter to the Corinthians, or at least the one that we refer to as 2 Corinthians, he closed it this way in, verses, in verse 14 of chapter 13. Last verse in the letter. And now... May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Paul was riveted to this idea of the grace that's in Christ Jesus. This past Wednesday, I was in Felch Township. It's not a town, it's not a city, it's not a village, it's a township. About an hour from here. 750 people live in that township. And I was meeting with a young pastor who I and our pastoral team here at Grace profoundly respect. His name is Joe Basso. And Joe and I interacted about our shared passion to see the Spirit of God empower the church across the UP to more effectively and fruitfully reach over a quarter of a million people in the UP who are unchurched. We're just trying to get our minds around this. And Joe has done extensive research. A lot of the survey demographics that we have of, of people in the UP as it would relate to issues of faith um, we've drawn from some pretty outstanding research that Joe has done, survey research across the UP. And as I have shared on a previous occasion, at the end of June, 82% of the people in the UP are unchurched, meaning in this survey data, they didn't attend church once last year. We're not talking about the Christers, Christmas and Easter attenders. We're, we're saying 82% didn't go to church once last year. And then we know among the 18% that are church, not all of them are in a gospel-oriented fellowship. And so the question becomes, what does that mean? What does it mean for a church that by virtue of our vision, we say, we want to know Christ. We want to make him known. What does that mean for us? We live in this slab of land. We're in the central UP. What does that mean? And we know that one of the imperatives, given the magnitude of the challenge in the UP, is that there have to be more leaders mobilized. There have to be more leaders mobilized. Both pastoral leaders and leaders at every level in our churches. Men, women, teens, children. Children. It's not too early to start leadership development with some of the children in this church. We need more leaders in order to make progress in church strengthening and more progress in establishing new gospel outposts throughout the UP. Only God, only the grace that's in the Lord Jesus can adequately equip us for the challenge. So we can either wash our hands of this or we lean in and wake up in the middle of the night and say, God, help us. This just, we don't want this to be okay with us. A quarter of a million people? We don't want this to be okay with us. 
Because God, we believe you're burdened about this. Your word says you desire all to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. You're not patient in keeping your promises. Some think of patience. But you're patient wanting all to come to repentance. It's a window of time as long as there's breath in people. All things are possible for God. Nothing's too difficult for him. And as I'm with Joe Basso on Wednesday, he made a statement that's landed on my soul. He said, we can't recruit and raise up leaders like the Army, Navy, or Air Force in their recruiting. I'm thinking, well, I respect all those branches of the military, and I'm not, I'm not tracking with what you're saying, Joe. I said, what do you mean? And Joe said, Army recruiters, by the way, please hear me out, everybody. I kept great respect for the Army, Navy, and the Air Force, okay? Great respect. But this, is what, this was Joe's point. In the Army, they say, join us, and we'll pay for your education. In the Navy, they'll say, join us, and you'll see the world. In the Air Force, they say, join us, and you will be on the cutting edge of technology that will leave you well suited in the days ahead in a technological world. I said, okay. And then Joe said, we need to recruit leaders like the Marines. And again, what, what, what do you mean? What do you mean? He said, Marine recruiters say, it's going to be really hard. It's going to be really hard. Really hard. If you can make it through basic training, you can be a Marine. There's a long history in the church of leaders who were raised up who knew it would be really hard. In Mark Batterson's book, All In, he essentially opens the book this way. A century ago, a band of brave souls became known as one-way missionaries. They purchased single tickets to the mission field without the return half. And instead of suitcases, they packed their few earthly belongings into coffins. As they sailed out of port, they waved goodbye to everyone they loved, everyone they knew. They knew they'd never return home. A.W. Milne was one of those missionaries. He set sail for the New Hebrides in the South Pacific, knowing full well that the headhunters who lived there had martyred every missionary before him. Milne did not fear for his life because he had already died to himself. His coffin was packed. For 35 years, he lived among that tribe and loved them. When he died... Tribe members buried him in the middle of their village and inscribed this epitaph on his tombstone. When he came, there was no light. When he left, there was no darkness. And then Batterson says this, when did we start believing that God wants to send us to safe places to do easy things? That faithfulness is holding the fort, that playing it safe is safe. And then he says this, Jesus didn't die to keep us safe. He died to make us dangerous. Dangerous to the kingdom of darkness because our resolve about the lordship of Jesus Christ, of who he is, and how desperately the people around us really need him. The one who's loved them more than anyone they've ever known. The one who gave himself for them. Stood in their place at the cross. And rose from the dead. And he's alive. Well, strength is that first word. The second one's going to be really short. I can tell you that. 
Be strong in the grace that's in Christ Jesus. Real quickly, there's a second word that's implicit in these two verses. It's the word strategy. Strategy. 2 Timothy 2.2. What you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses in trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. When you look at that verse, do you understand better why we had a group of men on the platforms today who are standing ready to entrust to others what God has first of all entrusted to them. Patiently, lovingly, in the context of relationship to share with others what God has placed in them. It's not a sophisticated strategy. It's relational. It's life on life. It's heart on heart. It's living with an open hand, receiving from God all that he wants to give to us, and then with that open hand, sharing and giving it away. In a sense, what Paul is saying, what God has been pressing into me, I want now to press into you. And Timothy, what God presses into you, you entrust to others as well. That's how we multiply leaders. Women with women. Men with men. Multiplication. This is the strategy for multiplication. As you saw this morning in discipling, mentoring relationships, one guy comes alongside another guy guy to help them grow. Multiplication. It is a kingdom of God theme. It's a principle. In the book of Acts, we see it. Multiplying believers, multiplying leaders, multiplying churches. Multiplication. Yes, people come to Christ one heart at a time, one life at a time, and we celebrate every addition that's there. And strategically, we want to be thinking about multiplication. How does a movement spread in the place where God has placed us? Paul was certainly committed to this dynamic of multiplication. We talked about it a little bit at the end of June here. We looked at Acts 13 and 14, the first missionary journey. Acts 13 and 14. Paul was going into cities along with Barnabas. They would go into a synagogue. They would share the gospel. They would see some people come to Christ who became there, kind of the incipient church. They would go on to the next city and the next city. And then when they came back, they retraced their steps and they found these new believers who had come to Christ when they had heard the gospel of Jesus. And what they did was appointed leaders. Isn't that interesting? They appointed leaders in every one of those cities because they not only were multiplying believers, their aim was to multiply leaders, which would in turn multiply churches throughout the Mediterranean world. In their book, Designed to Lead, Eric Geiger and Kevin Peck write, when church leaders see their lives as undeniably fleeting, I do, when church leaders see their lives as undeniably fleeting, it ignites, it ignites an urgency to make more leaders for God rather than to make more platforms for themselves. The risk of not making leaders is significantly more foolish than the risk implicit in making leaders. Friends, my life is undeniably fleeting. Over a decade ago, I began measuring my life from the end rather than from the beginning. That doesn't intimidate me. But it certainly brings perspective to the choices I make now. And investing in the next generation is part of that. I know many of you are going to resonate with this, but from my heart, Jesus Christ is worth everything. He's worth everything. He's with us now, and eternity is just around the corner. We believe in identifying and equipping emerging leaders for service in the church. Father in heaven, I pray your spirit would do what only your spirit could do in lives.
Father, I pray that your word would get pressed by your Holy Spirit into our thoughts, into our affections, into our priorities. God, help us for your glory, for our joy. In Jesus' name, amen.